Hello, everybody. I'm Joe McGovern, awards reporter here at The Wrap. We are happy to have you here for our awards screening of Elvis with producer Gail Berman, producer, production designer, costume designer, and four-time Academy Award winner, Catherine Martin, and the film's cinematographer, Mandy Walker. We're gonna show you the uh, trailer for Elvis, and then we'll get right into the conversation with Gail and Catherine and Mandy. And to our audience, please take part in the live chat of the stream and share your thoughts about the film and let us know where you're tuning in from. So before we bring on our guests, let's take a look at the trailer for Elvis. From Baz Luhrmann, the director who reimagined Shakespeare, reinvented the musical, and redefined a classic, comes a bold new vision of an American icon. But this ain't no nostalgia show. We're gonna do something different. Comic book heroes all find their superpowers. Elvis found music. Uh, bring that bass up, Jerry. I wish to promote you, Mr. Presley. I believe I can be great. But I'm but I'm Some people wanted to put me in jail. So Wells moving. Don't so much as wiggle a finger. I'm gonna show you what the real Elvis is like tonight. In that moment. Elvis, the man, was sacrificed. And Elvis, the god, was born. I would do anything to make sure my mama and daddy never have to live in poverty ever again. I think if you dream it, you'll do it. You do? Yeah. You put an end to your boy's animal behavior, or we will. There's a lot of people saying a lot of things. But in the end, you gotta listen to yourself. You bled me dry, and you still want more? I am a promoter. That is what I do. The way you say it is God given, so there can't be nothing wrong with it. Are you ready to fly? I'm ready to fly. Elvis, reading PG-13, Friday. Welcome back. It is my great pleasure to introduce Mandy, Mandy Walker, Gail Berman, and Catherine Martin. Congratulations. Thank you all for being here, the, the ladies of Elvis. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, you know, I wanted to just first start, of course, by congratulating you all. I mean, I'm the only one here who's not Academy Award nominated, uh, and um, it's a wonderful, uh, just a exciting tribute for this film and for all of you. And if I maybe could start with Catherine, because mm -hmm. this is your, you've had nine nominations. Um, I should also mention that you are the most winningest Australian in history with four Oscars. <laughs> Um, and you do have one more, one more in your total than Kate Blanchett, a fellow Australian. So that's uh, your. Uh, I, but for you, being nominated so many times, is it still the, the the thrill of a lifetime? I think you were in. Was were you in Paris this uh, this last yes. month? Just to see yes. those names and see the names of these the, the collaborators. Uh, what's the feeling? Oh, it's just a feeling of elation. I was particularly excited for two nominations. Mandy's historic nomination, one of only three women ever to be nominated for cinematography. So to me, that was something incredibly meaningful to me. In fact, surprisingly meaningful. Makes me feel emotional every time I feel about it. I felt feel such a sense of pride and a sense of celebration that um, Mandy, who's such an extraordinary artist and such a, um, a wonderful person to boot, is being recognised for her extraordinary work. And then also, um, you know, best film, because um, I'm being um, nominated with another fellow woman, Gail Berman, who's an extraordinary producer with an incredible career. It's a great honour. And as well as that, 
It's really a reflection of Baz's work. I mean, we only all stand there on the, st uh, you know, we only all stand there shoulder to shoulder with him. We're his backup singers, his support team, but he ultimately is our captain and his vision for the movie and his tenacity and his artistry and his generosity as a collaborator is the reason that we have a nomination and I'm just so thrilled his work is being celebrated. Yeah, um, well said. Uh, you know, Gail, I, I, Catherine just mentioned your, your career. Um, it is pretty extraordinary. I mean, started in theater, pr producing plays on, on Broadway. Uh, going in, you were the f one of the only people, I think the f only woman to ever ha had a major uh, TV network and a film network uh, with Fox and Paramount. Film um, studio, yes, yes. Studio, studio, I'm sorry. And uh, producing so many, so much good TV. It was about, I think, I think the rap had an exclusive nine years ago that there was potentially going to be a film of Elvis uh, of his life um, that, that you were involved in. What was it even way back then because you have such a, a great career coming out of television, how did you know, though, that this had to be a movie, you know, a big movie in the theater? Uh, well, thank you for all those fine compliments. And I want to salute my fellow females on our producing and production team. Uh, these are amazing women to be in the company of, and I'm truly humbled and honored to be among them. Um, the whole idea for this film was very simple. It was, what would the story of Elvis be like told through the lens of Baz Luhrmann? That was the vision, that was the whole idea, and that was what was worth waiting for. Because um, we know that a lot of Elvis projects have been done, and we've seen them on television and we've seen lots of different versions, but what could we do really going back to the real man, Elvis, the rebel Elvis, the music Elvis, and how would Baz tell that story um, was really what um, this journey has been about. And did you see the, the potential right away to, to tell the story as well of American culture in the 50s, 60s, and, and 70s, a very tumultuous, very, very fruitful time um, through the, the lens of this one individual, how he, he could really stand for a lot more. Well, one of the amazing things about visiting with Baz in the first place and knowing uh, his, his film, certainly uh, Gatsby was a great example of examining certain things through through uh, another lens. And so when I first met him and he described the idea of not just doing Elvis's story, but examining that period of time in America and really um, using him as the as the backdrop for a larger story, even though his story is, is a pretty operatic story as well. Um, I understood a lot better after having met with Baz what this, the epic nature of what this movie could be. Yeah, yeah. Because um, what we should never forget, and I should have mentioned, without Gail, there would be no Elvis. It was something she pursued Baz um, tirelessly to do. And I, I also um, had Catherine help me from time to time. I would go <laughs> out to lunch with her in New York. And I'd say, hey, you know, if we did this or we did that. So she was a co-conspirator at various times. I will say that. <laughs> but um, yes, it was very much something. It was a meeting of the mind. So Baz had had in his mind for over 30 years, he wanted to do this story or he, whether it was as concrete as that, but it was a subject that he was profoundly interested in. And it was kismet when Gail kind of, doggedly with extraordinary determination pursued and willed this film into being. That is a kind way of saying how annoying I can be. And I love <laughs> I love Sam for, for saying it so, so kindly. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, that's what good producers do. Um, so congratulations, you know, just again. Uh, and I want to involve uh, Mandy. Um, we've, you know, even if people don't know your name, they they know your work uh, from Hidden Figures and uh, Australia. You worked with Boz and Catherine before. Um, Shattered Glass is one of my favorites. Uh, Thank you. And Mulan. And I, I so I don't want to, I don't want to sound like I'm reducing any part of your career to, to referring to you as a woman cinematographer. But as Catherine said, I mean, Catherine's category of best costume, costume design at the Oscars is all women. You are the third in 95 years to be nominated. And all recently, by the way, like in the last few years. Yes. Um, so I just think that, that, that there's something exceptional about that. And I think that maybe you can speak to the opportunities that, because that's what it's all about, right? It's it's about making sure that, that the film schools uh, are are educating in the right way. And um, I spoke to your colleague uh, Greg Frazier, who won the Oscar for Dune last year, and he said he's very excited for the next five or ten years in cinematography to just see see new um, new voices, new new lenses, I guess. Yeah. Um, I think, as you say, it's it's been a long time for um, any woman to be recognised in this way, and um, but it's definitely changing. And there's a real positive movement to 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 be more inclusive and diverse in um, in the camera department, definitely. And you know, I have to also champion Baz in this way because when I shot Australia, no woman had ever shot a film that big you know and and on that scale and he was the first one to give me that opportunity um so i feel that you know he was a bit of a trailblazer in that way and but definitely now i feel that everybody's more conscious and aware that there isn't many women in the camera department and i think it's still only like six percent or something like that of dp so yeah it's it's for me it's it's an exciting time that it that um that we are doing good work and being recognized for it. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I w- want to really talk about the, the visual style, but I, but first something I, I didn't know until I, I read a different interview with you, Boz had you come in to be in the audition with, with Austin Butler. Yeah. Um, he, he, go on. Sorry. No, I mean, I just, I didn't, I don't, I don't often think of a cinematographer being present for those kinds of things, but that's an amazing detail for us to know how important it was that, that you were in the room. I think, you know, it echoes what CM and Gail was saying is that Baz is a great collaborator and he has a vision. He's a visionary, I think. And there, you know, not many people like that in the world. Um, and so he will get us all involved really early. And for me, yeah, I was at Austin's audition with my little Leica camera running around looking at angles on him already and, and you know, then jumping over to Baz and saying, look on this three-quarter, he really looks like Elvis here. And when he moves this way, this lens looks good on him and exploring already um, the visual language of, of how we were going to shoot him. And then I think... Um, I think it was like nine months before we started pre-production. So I was sort of in and out during that period. And we talked about the research that I was going to do on the existing footage of Elvis because anybody can go online and see all these con- uh, quite a few of the concerts, the Vegas concert in That's the Way It Is and the Russwood concert in Stills photographs by Alfred Wertheimer and um, and also the 68 special, the NBC comeback special. So I had to do meticulous research. So it gave me that time to kind of be working on that and because I knew I had to reproduce it exactly. But also to, for Baz and I to just start talking with Catherine and Karen Murphy and all the other departments about the uh, visual language of the movie. So it was a harmonious um integration of all the elements of the film, you know, the production design and um, costume design and hair and makeup and visual effects and everything. So that's something that happens with Baz really early on because that, as you say, you know, we had to reproduce to an audience the 50s, the 60s and the 70s. And how are we going to do that in a way that people that were around that time would recognise and and young people would be introduced to what it was like to be in that environment and to be in those places that Baz, uh, that yeah. Elvis existed. 
I think, you know, the, the recreations, and we can, of course, talk to Catherine as well, but I wanted to ask Mandy about the recreations are, are uh, themselves extraordinary. There's also um, times in which there's a montage and the, the like pictures within pictures in the film that I love, but also there's a, there's also the the Fantasia quality of this, which is that we're being led through this world by the Colonel. And yeah. oftentimes the camera's floating or kind of flying around. Also, you see sometimes characters very small within their bigger environment. Um, mm -hmm. What about that that visual language, finding that, the, 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 the sort of rhythm of it, getting it just right? Well, I think one of the very, very early on Baz said to me, there's three languages for the camera in this movie. The camera has to dance with Elvis. We have to fly with him when he's flying. And then when the, there's a, also the dramatic element of the film and when that happens and the drama's heavy or the emotions are, are, are um, intense, that we would slow down and be very observational and elegant. So with those three things in mind and then how to integrate them so that, you know, we would be doing what we call train spotting, which was replicating the concert footage exactly. Um, and, you know, I had to research all the lighting and the lenses. I had lenses built for the movie and I put our cameras inside the TV cameras to be on exactly the right line and things like that. But there was also drama happening in the background in all those um, sequences. So how to integrate that into the movie so it never jumped was also something that I worked on for a long time. Um, and, and how to, to, as you were saying, when we had the split screen or the montage sequences, they were all pretty much you know, thought about beforehand. I mean, they all were developed in the editing room, obviously, but the whole thing like the burning love sequence, we we had um, planned to have him, you know, in the middle of the frame and replicate that with each costume. And so there's a lot of stuff that was um, it, like we spent a lot of time testing and there was with Catherine's um, uh uh, he, she works with Chris Tange, who's like a, a, a concept artist who works with you and Baz, doesn't he? And a lot, and we had him um, give us reference material where that the a concept art for the um, a lot of the shots and a lot of the locations, which she might want to talk about more, so that I knew already the moments that we had to fly and the moments that we had to dance and the moments that we had to be very still and observational. Catherine, um, I'd, I'd like you to maybe to talk about that, but also, I, I mean, we, we, we can't uh, forget to mention these extraordinary sets that were all built in Australia. Um, I mean, Graceland was built in Australia for this film, which, uh, and and you, is it true that you, Boz and you had an office in the real Graceland, which you could work out of? Yes, Baz, over an 18-month period, had an office at the back of Graceland. I visited Graceland a number of times with Chris Tangy and with Karen Murphy, my co-production designer. And it was fantastic because we also had an unprecedented access to the archives. And we were taken, uh, well, Angie Marchese, who um, is the head of the archives at Graceland, was just so generous with her time and took us under her wing. And we saw everything from, you know, the inside coat closet of Graceland downstairs to be able to pick the perfect blue of the first time we see Graceland to having the privilege of opening up the archive boxes of, um, of Gladys's clothing and just feeling the humanity of that person it was a kind of profound sadness, a kind of unrequited, uh, it, it felt almost like unrequited love or longing just pouring out of these boxes. And I think that that unprecedented access allowed us a window into the humanity of the man that I think really brought so much to the movie. And of course, Austin, who just found a way of embodying Elvis, interpreting 
that person so that we weren't just seeing a kind of strange, slavish, uncanny valley imitation, but as collaborators, he won us into the world and then he won the whole world into Elvis's psyche and being as a person. Well, and you know, just to speak briefly about your work as a costume designer again, I mean, uh, I, I know there are over a hundred sets that were built, so who knows, I can't even imagine how many costumes changes there were, but some of them are, are iconic, the the white jumpsuit and the, 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 the pink tuxedo, but it was more than just creating replicas that would um, fit on Austin. You had to make sure that his, that Austin, the actor, his body would make us feel the same way that um, Elvis Presley's did. Is that right? I mean, yes, absolutely. That was Baz's focus. Yeah. Very early on, the three of us came to the realization that slavish imitation was just going to make it feel like we were creating, you know, Halloween costume, and that there needed to be a nexus between Austin and his interpretation of Elvis and historical accuracy. So we spent a long time thinking about how to do that, and I think Baz really kind of um, gave us a key into how to solve this conundrum. And that was to think, for instance, Bill Ballou designed Elvis's costumes for the 68 special. He's responsible for that, you know, Napoleonic collar and the ju latter, latter jumpsuits of the 1970s. And Baz said, where Bill Ballou designing costumes for Austin Elvis. So they're the absolutely realistic, as real as possible costumes that were designed for Elvis. But there are subtle changes that make them fit, you know, Austin's physique. Everybody has a slightly different height of neck or yeah. their butt's slightly different. So the pockets need to be moved. And I think that we did a similar thing with something like Beale Street, where we built two blocks of Beale Street, one and a half stories on a disused um, um, like landfill dump. And the government very kindly gave it to us and we built a road and we built buildings. But Baz had Karen and I and the whole team and Chris analyze all of the important landmarks on Beale Street and all the important stores that were influential in Elvis's life. And if Elvis actually walked that, we'd be, we'd have a seven and a half hour movie, you know? So the idea was to keep the inherent and truthful and respectful geography of Beale Street, but to condense the shop fronts so that when he walks down the street and we discover Elvis's joy and enthusiasm and love of Beale Street, we're doing it in a concise way. We discover it with him. So the research and the emphasis on historical reproduction was absolutely paramount. But at the same time, we knew that we weren't um, making a documentary. We were trying to be respectful and um, expressive of a man's life. As Baz said, we were trying to express how it felt like to be there. We yep. needed to explain to the audience where they were. So it was a constant balance between absolutely painstaking recreation and then also using all the historical knowledge to condense and synthesize it into storytelling environments. Thank you. Um, I just have one last question before we have to wrap up. Um, you know, this uh, you're very close to sort of the end of this journey. The Oscars are, are coming up and, you know, the, you've worked on this in Gail's case for nearly a whole decade and uh, for Catherine and Mandy, um, you know, five, four or five years. Um, but there must be something 
that sort of really is very satisfying to know that once this journey for for you for the creative team is over the film um will just continue to to move people uh people who saw it in the theater when they were 14 15 16 they'll be seeing it again when they're 26 and 36 um and maybe if you could just comment on that and perhaps also mention i i know it must be difficult because amid all the joy and the celebration there's also the sadness uh of losing lisa marie um who clearly was you know uh loved you guys you and you loved her back um so maybe just if you just mention that but also just the fact that as sad as it is that she's gone this this film this tribute uh to her family in a way will uh endure thank you so much for bringing that up um i do want to say that um we grieve lost lisa marie she was an extraordinary uh, partner at the end of our journey. Uh, when she went to see the film, I was with Baz. Uh, she went alone to see the film in a large theater on the Warner Brothers lot. Um, she came out, she was quite overcome, and it took her several days to really process her thoughts and talk to Baz about what the film had accomplished for her and for her family in her mind. And she was a lovely person. She was soft-spoken and she was interested in things and interested in, in what you had to say, but she was entirely gracious to us by opening up her home, Graceland, to us, throwing us a, a premiere a party and a private barbecue and allowing us access to her thoughts of the house, et cetera. And so um, our, our, our loss, the film's loss, obviously the family's loss is, is tremendous and we, we grieve for her and the family. Um, it, to the earlier part of your question about what the legacy of the film is and that it will be around, I remember once uh, probably one of the final screenings that I had uh, at Warner Brothers of the film. And I thought to myself, um, you know, someday I'm going to be flip, flipping um, on my remote and I'm going to see this movie on television and I'm going to stop to look at it. And it was really, an inc I've had that many, many times with television shows and I've never had it with a film. And for me, that thought was so enormous. And uh, I loved the movie so much. And the idea that you could just be flipping and see it was, um, I don't know, it was, it was incredibly awesome to me. Like just somebody somewhere flipping, sees it, stops to watch this beautiful movie. An amazing thing, just amazing to me. These two women are so, I, I just want to highlight the girl power here because oh, yeah. they're great, great collaborators and women and people to hang out with. So in addition to their artistry, they're just great, <laughs> great girls. Well, I, I just, to, to end, I guess it's, it's, uh, it's important to point that out that this, that teenage boys will go crazy, but especially younger women, uh, seeing this film, seeing their own experiences reflected in it through through Elvis. Um, maybe Catherine, do you want to just finish by talking about what that's going to mean for generations that that this this iconic figure from the from last century uh, will will be remembered um, uh, in such a meaningful way? Well, I think that's one of the most touching things and most profound things that has happened on the movie is that the Presley family has embraced the movie and that they feel that it is a respectful and true telling of their um, father and grandfather's life and that the story 
that is set against this sort of operatic backdrop of American history will kind of be there to be watched and re-watched. I mean, time will tell whether, you know, the movie stands the test of time. We're not, you know, we, we can't be the arbiters of that. But I know that Baz and I really love the fact that Romeo and Juliet, even though it was made in the late 90s, is still being seen by teenagers today, um, particularly in school, much to our children's chagrin. They go, if, if someone makes us watch that ever again at school, we need a note. We need a note. Give me a note. I need to do this. But um, I think that idea that you could, for a brief moment in time, have been part of making something a story that talks to a larger human experience and a larger human story that people can share in all around the world at a time when we seem to be focusing on difference. But the reality is humans have far more in common than they do, um, you know, than they do conflict. And I think that stories like the story of Elvis, which is a big, universal story they're really important to tell because they connect us all thank you so much um and and to all three of you i mean just just uh how exciting to be able to chat about this i know you have a very exciting day uh ahead for for you and i'm uh wish you all the best and you know thank you. just congratulations and and have a blast uh on uh on oscar night um you know it's just we will <laughs> we, we will, will. <laughs> Congratulations. We just have to keep it together long enough. <laughs> <laughs> Not too much champagne. Okay, yes. lady? Okay. Not okay. too much. You, okay. Okay. She will be a very good monitor. No, not so much. <laughs> That's the producing. No, That's I'm the worst. <laughs> I'm the worst. <laughs> Thank you, uh, really, so much. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for joining us today. Be sure to take advantage of our free trial to Rap Pro and be the first to know about upcoming rap screenings and events. You can catch up on any past screenings you may have missed by visiting therap.com screenings tab in the main bar.